This progression involves four different chords, D minor, C over D, B flat over D, and G over D. Let's give it a listen. You can hear that each chord occurs for four beats, one measure, and it's a four-bar phrase. Look at your accompanying chart where we break down the chords and the actual chords that the names imply and the respective scales. For the D minor, we just call it a D minor, it's what it is. We're going to choose D Aeolian mode, which is mode six of an F major scale. We'll talk about that more in depth in just a minute. For the C over D, one way to perceive that would be to say it's a C add nine and third inversion. You could also think of it as a D minor 11 without the flatted third, or as a D9 sus4. So if we look at it as a C add 9 and third inversion, the advantage is that it gets us close to the numerator, the upper portion of the slash chord. We'll think of it that way, so the respective scale will be C mixolydian. That's mode 5, again, in the key of F. So that's convenient because the first two chords are in the key of F. Let's look at the next chord. B flat over D would simply be a B flat triad in first inversion, meaning the third of the chord is in the bass. So you're gonna use B flat Lydian. That's mode four of an F major scale. So as you can see, the first three chords of this progression are all in the key of F theoretically. The street key would be D minor, and that's gonna serve you when you start applying pentatonic scales to this progression. But let's look at the fourth chord. On appendix B, you have your major scales and all the diatonic triads that are built from them in a chart form. You can see when we looked at the chords that were in the key of F, you just read down the left-hand column to the key of F, and looking at the columns, you can see they're 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 4, and 5 are majors, 2, 3, and 6 are minors. This is all basic diatonic harmony. So everything we've done up to this point indeed was in the key of F. But in the key of F, G is the second scale degree, and what kind of chord is built off the second degree? A minor chord. So this G over D cannot be in the key of F. And also, because a G chord has a B note in it, there's more proof that it can't be in the key of F. Well, we're going to look at this G over D as being the five chord in the key of C. So when you look at your chart, you can see a G over D is second inversion major triad. So G mix leading, which is mode five, will be our choice. That means that this whole progression is in two different keys. The first three chords are in the key of F, theoretically, and the last chord is in the key of C. Now, that's not too bad because the key of F and the key of C only have one note different. The key of C has that B natural, the key of F has the B flat. So when you look at your different charts and diagrams, you will see only one note changes between these two tonal centers. That makes it really easy. And by the way, this progression uses the same three chords in the first half of the progression as was in the previous lesson on our slash chord progressions. So you'll see that we've just changed the order and it's a very common progression. All right, now I wanna talk about how to play chords over this thing. We're going to listen to the jam track where it's just bass and drums. I provide both of them for each of these progressions, one with the chords, which is what you just listened to, and we'll use that when we're soloing because you want those chords in the background, but also just the bass and the drums. So before we play over the track, let's just lay out some chords, and this is where your diagrams will serve you. And you can see on your outline here, diagrams 4A through 4E will give you all the information you need in terms of arpeggios, just the basic triad arpeggios, and the respective modes. Let's just go to fifth position, for example. Here's a standard D minor chord using the A minor form, right? You recognize that. Okay, and notice I have the D in the bass. I'm not barring all the way across because I don't want D minor over A. And that's my pedal tone. The next chord I need is a C chord over a D bass. Well, I can just grab it by playing the middle four strings because I have a C triad right here coming out of a G form from your cage system. So if I just choose to play the middle four strings, I have D minor. Then I need a B flat. Now I have a couple ways I could do this. I could just move that C triad down a whole step. And if I choose to do that, it's gonna lose the bass a little bit if I go. You have to move very quickly and accurately to keep that D ringing. Well, you know, if you've watched any of my videos, you know I like to push the envelope on fingerings. I don't like to lock myself up. So let me give you something, a little challenge. If I play the D minor with my second, third, and fourth fingers and double stop the fourth and the third strings with my little finger, what that does is allows me to have my D minor right there. You 
see how I captured my C over D? Now you're probably thinking, is this guy gonna be throwing these weird fingerings at us? No, I'm just gonna give you a few and you can do it however you want. There's my C over D. Third finger's on the E, second finger's barring the fifth, fourth, and third strings. And then I can just roll back up with my second finger, play the B flat over D. See how that's just coming right out of that B flat chord right there. So that's just one place, one way to play it. When you're playing along with the jam track, you've got the D bass already being played. So you don't have to play this D bass. But this is important. A slash chord needs to have the bass note in place, or at least you have to think about it, to know the total harmonic picture. Meaning this, if I play the D minor, and I've just got the D bass, everything's fine. But what if the bass note was a different bass note? What if it changes things? You can hear that. It changes the picture tremendously. Okay, so make sure when you practice these that you are able to play them in a solo guitar context, meaning... keeping the D bass in place, and that'll challenge you in your technique because you'll have to come up with fingerings. You might say, well, man, I could just sit here and play the open D, and let's look at it that way. Play the D minor up on top, then your C over D, B flat over D, G over D. Let me just stop for a moment. If you're a little bit lost and you don't, you're not able to follow what I'm doing, it means you need to go back and learn your triads up and down the neck of the fingerboard. I'll help you do this right now. You can look at diagram 4A, for example. You can see the red notes are all roots, flatted thirds, and fifths, the DFA that spells a D minor chord. Now, since there are only three different notes in the triad, you have three one-note-per-string arpeggios. I've covered this in a lot of other courses. You can find it all over the place. So make sure you can see these one-note-per-string arpeggios. Okay, out of that, then just stay on the same string group and see your rotation of your inversions. Now, inversions mean the following. Here's DFA. So it's a root position D minor triad. If I move each note in the chord up to the next note in the chord, I get the next inversion. Now the flatted third is the lowest voice, so it's the first inversion. If I move each note up to the next note in the chord, I get second inversion. So you can see on each string group, you're only going to have three inversions on the second, third, and fourth strings. If you look at the diagram, you can see the F, A, D, flat three, five, one right there, out of diagram four, A. Now, I'm numbering these diagrams. There are a couple different ways we can number these diagrams. Um, this course is a standalone course just with this group of lessons on this disc, but it's also going to be a huge course. So ultimately, we're going to have about 11 or about 10 or 11 progressions. So that's why I have these diagrams numbered 4A, 4B, and things like that, because on the big picture, we're going to go right down the line with all these different progressions. So technically, if you're looking at this just as a standalone disc, it's you know progression number one, but I'm going to label it as progression number four. So if that seems a little confusing, you'll see it in the end how it all pans out. Okay, then what you can do is then come up with other voicings. If I played the D minor and I put the D on top, the only problem is I'm losing one of the chord tones, right? So let's just stay with the actual triads, make sure you get all three tones in there. But then we have this issue of voice leading. Now guitar players are notorious for going and that works for basic rhythm guitar, right? You need a big wall of sound, that's fine, root in the bass. But here we have a pedal tone in the bass, meaning that constant D. Make sure you move to different inversions. Let's look at this. Play your D minor up here in the 10th position. See on diagram 4A where you have the flatted third, the fifth, and the root. Then I need to go to a C. Well, go over and look at the uh, progression uh, diagram 4B. You can see that you have your C mixolydian and all the C triads in red. So you have C triad there or C triad there. The point is you want to go to the closest one. Well, in this case, they're pretty much about the same distance from the D minor. 
when you go to the B flat. Do you see how I'm just seeing each of the three triads on those top three strings? That way you can just pedal that fourth string open as your bass line. Make sense? The next place you could take it, and I'm going to demonstrate this against the drum bass track, is to take the chords... Here, how I'm putting all these other little moving lines, little counter melodies and things in there. Where do those come from? From the modes that you see in these diagrams. For example, let's just play against the track, and I'm going to demonstrate some of this stuff, and I'll just take it real slow and narrate it as I play, and I won't give you too much, and hopefully you can follow me. We're going to start off with that D minor in the 10th position, coming right out of your E minor form. Okay. Looking at the Daolian mode for on the first string, let's just use the first string as our melody line here. I have four notes up on top, D, E, F, G. Against that D minor chord, they are one, two, flat, three, four, right? And then I would have those same notes, but it would be in C mixolydian. C diagram 4B. Same thing, but now the red notes are the C chord, 5, 1, 3, but now the numbers are 2, 3, 4, 5. And then, because remember, all three of those chords are in the key of what? F. Here I'm just looking. Just F major information on the neck. Okay, let me play against the track, and you kind of play along and follow. I'm going to keep it real simple at first, just try and get what I'm doing. G chord, so let's do it again. Okay, now if you notice, I changed the order of the chords there. That last time I went D minor, then I went B flat instead of going C to D. How come I can get away with that? How can I mix the chords up and not play the exact progression that's written here? Because all you're playing against is a bass note, a D pedal. So I could go to any chord. So I just demonstrated how, if you're playing against the jam track, just bass and drums, feel free to experiment with changing the progression around. The point of each of these progressions is that you have some common chords. D minor, which is the sixth chord in the key of F. C over D, which is functioning as a C add nine, so we'll think of it as a five in the key of F over a six bass. B flat which is the four in the key of F, again over that sixth bass, and then we switch to the key of C, playing the G chord over the D bass. So in the key of C, it's a five over two bass. You could definitely move these around in different sequences. I mean, do you see how huge this is? You could go... Just have fun, experiment. Now you might say, why do I want to do that? Well, you got to get your ears on to where you can hear this information and recognize these slash chords. I have found that students seem to have a more difficult time with slash chords, and it's understandable because you're not hearing this sort of stuff. If I went... What do you hear? In your face, you've got that bass line. And as guitar players, what do we do? We usually find the bass line, and build some power chords, majors and minors, and then build up from there. This involves more hearing of these inversions. So, hopefully you can take this lesson and not just be locked into what I've given you in terms of the order of these chords, okay? And you'll see how we change the order of these sometimes and maybe not start with the D minor. For example... What am I doing there? I'm starting the progression with the G over D. 
So it could go a lot of different ways. Hopefully you see how that will serve you tremendously. And I also want you to understand how huge this business is of seeing the entire neck, seeing these chords, and being able to connect them in this fashion that you see me play. The reason I can do that is I've played for a long time, and as I see, play a chord, I see the arpeggio, like the diagrams, I see them as red notes. That's one way to label it. They stand out, right? Then I see all the other notes in the scale, the remaining four notes, because these are triads, all around them. And I also know how the notes are going to sound ahead of time. That takes a long time. You have to really be thinking and listening while you practice. And this is where I'd suggest you just stay in one area. Don't try to learn the entire fingerboard. Indeed, you could just move up and down the length of the string. That works out well when you have this open bass note business. But take one area and just work over playing, work on playing over the progression, over the bass drum track, and just get these chords under your fingers and get the sounds in your head. Then start building. Now, a final thing I want to show you is just the idea of taking a chord. And where I have the same maybe one or two notes changing, for example. Like you saw me do it up here. It's a little crowded. I'll probably do a double stop. You know? So there I just had this little melody over and over again. Practicing these in your rhythm playing will help you tremendously. I mean, I can't imagine it any other way. When you go to play your lead stuff, instead of thinking you got to play a zillion notes, you start to hear what, it, what happens when you... For example, let's play over the track where we have the bass, the drums, and the rhythm guitar. And I'll just play a little line on top. Actually, in the rhythm guitar part, I did some of this stuff. So let's just give this a listen. You'll see what I'm talking about playing just a couple of notes over the chords. Listen to how melodic that is. You're not trying to cram a million notes in and show, you know, show people how well you know your scales and how much chops you have. I mean, there's a time and a place for that. Don't get me wrong. I love shredding, and you can practice shredding over this, but I'd suggest you really get melodic because in your shredding, you still want to be melodic. Okay, now, in uh, the next section of this progression, we're going to dig in a little deeper about soloing over this progression. <laughs> 